Good morning everybody, this is Stephen Pugh of the Home Bible College. I want to do another instalment, uh, mini lecture, on the subject of um, dispensationalism. This is uh, going to be lecture number three and it's going to be the subject of the Adamic Covenant. Now a lot of people are not aware of the Adamic Covenant but um, let me read the scriptures to you. It's in Genesis chapter 3 verse 14 to 19. The Lord God said unto the servant, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly thou shalt go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. <clears throat> and unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat it of it, all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field, and in the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread. Thou shalt return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. <coughs> now, this is, notice that last little bit, this is something that's often mentioned in a funeral service. I've mentioned it myself in a funeral service. It says, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. So the direct consequences of the sin of Adam was mortality. He was made out of dust, and he will return to dust. Okay, dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Now this is a covenant between Adam as representative of the whole human race again. Um, however there are four provisions mentioned in the four principal characters. First of all the serpent. The serpent is cursed above all cattle. Now that little word cattle it just means animals of course and uh, what the Lord is saying is that amongst all animals the serpent is cursed above them all. The serpent will go forth on his belly. Now we all know that snakes um, crawl upon their belly. And the serpent will eat dust all his life. And this of course is a truism. Not being very close to the ground, being on the ground, they eat dust all the time. And so and so this was the this was the curse that was put upon the serpent, on the serpent. And um, he also says concerning the concerning Satan himself, he says there will be enmity between you and the woman. Now enmity means a constant state of war, a constant state of war. There will be a constant state of war between um, the Satan and the woman um, <clears throat> because your seed between your seed and her seed now remember in the life of Christ on one occasion the Lord Jesus was speaking to those that uh, opposed his message his, me his message and he said you are you are the uh, sons of the devil okay so the seed of the woman and the seed of Satan are opposed. Some people mistakenly think that every person that's unsaved is um, of the seed of Satan. That's obviously not true. Um, but the point is um, there are certain people who by their lives and by their confession uh, confess themselves to be of the seed of Satan. And uh, the Lord says you will bruise his heel, okay, but your head will be crushed. That's the difference between the two. And the Lord Jesus, of course, is the seed of the woman in that sense. And his heel was um, 
his, his, his heel was bruised, but Satan's head was crushed. Okay. Now, about the woman in verse, verse 16, he says this. He says, the Lord will greatly multiply thy sorrow and conception. Now, we don't really quite know what this means. It could be that the Lord is saying that the pain of childbirth will be greatly increased. Or he could be saying that, the, that your conception will be greatly increased. Um, th th does that mean the length of time? <clears throat> Does that mean the 40 weeks of pregnancy? It's very hard to quite to know what this means. But certainly the Lord says that, you, that the Lord will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. He says, in sorrow you will bring forth children. Now that's a truism. Some people say, you see, ah, well this is a covenant with Adam and it's nothing to do with today. Listen now, all those of you that are women, all those of you that are mothers, what was your childbirth like? Because it's something that exists in great pain. It's something that is a great trial to women in childbirth. And lastly, he says in verse 16, your desire will be towards your husband and he will rule over you. And so this is a universal principle. It's not something about Christianity. It's not something about um men dominating women it's not about that at all the reality is that God has stated according to the um, covenant with Adam that men will um, rule over the household and even even up till the present time um, when you have a census um, sometimes it will say head head of the house head of the household and there was a time of course not very long ago in which um, men uh, were the head of the household in the sense that um, women didn't have any voting rights and didn't have any rights apart from having a husband. But it's not about that either. This is something from creation. This is something from the very beginning. Uh, men will rule over their wives. And this is a truism. This is something that God says. <clears throat> and then lastly, he talks to the wife, talks to the man in verse 17 19 he says because you listen to your wife cursed is the ground now he's not saying that we must never listen to our wives that's not what he's saying at all he's saying look in this particular regard at this particular time adam you listened to your wife right you knew that she was deceived but you listened to what she said and you were not deceived and you were in complete open rebellion against me and you listened to what your wife said knowing that that wasn't true and so as a result of that the ground is cursed for you in sorrow you will eat of it all the days of your life the life of a man on earth is a life that's hard it's a life that's a struggle. Go and speak to any farmer. Of course, go and speak to somebody in Africa that's trying to eke out a living on a bit of dirt that they managed to dig over and they put some plants in. Go and ask them if the life is easy and you'll find that the life is hard. In sorrow you will eat of it all the days of your life. You will find thorns and thistles instead of crops and you will eat herbs and you will eat bread by the sweat of your face and you will be you will be buried you are dust and you will return to dust now then <clears throat> some of the things that he's saying here some of the things he's saying to add to man are universal to men and women which is very different to um, Eve when the Lord spoke to Eve the things he said to her were personal to herself but to Adam, he said, he says, you are dust and unto dust you will return. He says, Adam, you will be buried in the dust that you came from. That is the Adamic covenant. Now, this covenant is unconditional. It obviously is still in force today. The principles of this covenant remain exactly the same today. And that is why women have pain in child, childbirth and this is why men sweat over their hard work 
it will it will cease this covenant will cease when the Lord Jesus the second man the last Adam comes to establish a kingdom that will be Edenic in character it will be like Eden again and will never pass away in that day when will forget the curses of the old order in that day when men plant upon the earth it will bring forth abundance hundredfold there will be no weeds there will be no thorns in the messianic kingdom okay and there will be it won't be hard work it will be delightful work you see so the adamic covenant is not eternal it is only until christ establishes his kingdom <clears throat> it is incorrect to say that mankind has no relation to god every human being is in this covenant you see there's a common idea put forward by most christians saying oh well um, nobody has a relationship with god unless you're a christian well that's not actually true adam and eve had a relationship with god and it was a relationship in covenant they were not christians they were not saved as people today are saved by grace and through faith they were in covenant and they had law and they had sacrifices to make and they were under the judgment of god if they were wicked and they were under the blessing of god if they were righteous <clears throat> so in this covenant then there is responsibility responsibility to god and responsibility to live righteously before god to bring worship to the lord we see this in the life of cain and abel where they both made sacrifices to the lord this was a bound duty they had to make sacrifices to god they had to go through the rituals of worship they also had to make sin offerings if ever they discovered that they had sinned they had to live number three according to conscience and the knowledge of god which was revealed now this knowledge of god it isn't something that comes through scripture this is a knowledge of god that comes through the mind of god which is put into the heart of every man we get into romans and paul explains that every human being understands god perfectly it is revealed into the heart of every single human being every man knows what sin is every man knows what sin is and every man knows what's right and what's wrong and those that do that which is right in the eyes of the lord are the just and the just are the righteous um to say that men can do um to say that men cannot do that which is right before god is incorrect man must serve and honor god in spite of sin and failure and this is where calvinism would lead the christian world astray the idea of total depravity is not scriptural unconverted men that is people that are not christians are capable of having a relationship with god outside of christian salvation as we have it in the church it is true that a man is unable to save himself as a christian but he can believe the gospel and prior to that he can serve god and pray to him and his prayers and good deeds it can be acceptable to god now we see the proof of this in the case of cornelius you know the acts of the apostles is a tremendous book with amazing insight and in the case of cornelius before he met peter it was said of him that is before he was a christian it was said of him that he was a god a gentile god-fearing righteous man who gave charity to the poor and the angel of the lord said about his prayers that they came right up to the throne of heaven and his works were had in memorial with god yet he was still unsaved and had to go to peter to discover what the gospel was and how to become a christian <clears throat> and when he met peter he wanted to bow down to him and said but peter said no don't, don't do that i am a righteous man like you yet when cornelius heard the gospel he was saved and he was baptized and became a member 
of the Christian church. He was probably the first Gentile to be saved. So clearly we need to revise our thinking about the unsaved. When one looks at the conditions of this covenant, the covenant with Adam, it becomes clear that this continues today for the uncivilized and for the Gentile and for the Jew through subsequent con co covenants, uh, the Lord gave more light and put upon them greater responsibility. Uh, Paul addresses the noble savage in the letters to the Romans and confirms that he is a sinner just like Adam was and to have fallen um, and to have fallen as a society into ignorance and idolatry and vice. Now in each of these covenants we have a sacrificial system and we have a priesthood. This is why the children of Adam offered sacrifice to the Lord. Abel offered a better sacrifice than Cain because he had faith in God and that probably led to a willingness to learn the correct acceptable manner of offering. Now in Cain's rejection of his offering the Lord encouraged Satan, sorry encouraged Cain. He says I want you to offer a better sacrifice and yet he warned him also of the sin that was waiting to enter his home and his heart. Now, none of the people in this covenant are saved. As we Christians know it today, they are nevertheless in a relation with God, okay, through the covenant. And that brought them into responsibilities and privileges. They had the responsibility to love God and their fellow men. They had the duty to live righteously according to law and the duty to offer sacrifices of worship and their privilege was to have a wonderful relationship of blessing with God and access to him in prayer and in worship. So clearly, now these people are not saved. <clears throat> They're not Christians. Clearly, we need to rethink what we understand. The Bible teaches about people that are not saved. Uh, somebody said to me recently, well, surely Adam was a Christian. <laughs> no, he wasn't a Christian. He, he had no idea about what being a Christian would be all about. But he was nevertheless in a relationship with God. And that relationship with God was in a covenant. It was in a covenant. It was in a blood covenant. And the Lord had brought him into this wonderful relationship in which he could worship God and serve God and bless God every day. Well, there we are. So that's the Adamic covenant. And this need, this means that we need to reframe and rethink how we understand the covenants of God. We need to just rethink them and understand what the, what the scripture actually teaches. Well, we look forward to speaking to you on the next, next lecture. That'll be lecture number four, in which we will deal with the, the covenant with Noah. God bless you. See you next time. God willing. Bye for now.